Hello everyone. This is the second part of our lecture on functional programming for CS151. I want to start off by talking about Alan Turing and Alonzo Church. So you might remember in the second lecture of the semester we talked about Alan Turing who was trying to answer questions about computability. He was trying to answer a really deep question that is what are the set of problems that can be solved? all the problems that could possibly be solved and separate those out, those out from the problems that cannot be solved in principle. Another way of thinking about it is what algorithms can be executed. That's equivalent to asking what problems can be solved. And he showed that the universal computer, the universal Turing machine, is able to execute all algorithms and therefore in principle can solve all problems that can be solved. Now, just before he proved that, another mathematician named Alonzo Church was also investigating this problem of what is the set of all things that can be proven or solved, what algorithms can be, can be followed. And he came to the same conclusion. He showed the same set of problems could be solved. But he used something called a lambda calculus to do this. So lambda calculus is simply showing that functions and functions of functions can define all solvable problems. We've been talking about functional programming for a little bit, and it turns out that functional programming has its roots in this lambda calculus. We've already talked about a couple of principles of functional programming. One is that um, you can't have side effects. Another is that we use recursion, so functions call themselves a third principle we're going to add today is the idea of higher order functions, which is that you can have functions that take other functions as their arguments. In other words, we're going to start treating functions as if they were values. Let me show you what that looks like from a practical point of view. And as an aside, this is why I think computer science is really interesting. It goes the whole breadth from asking deep questions about what can be solved in principle, what are all the problems that can possibly be solved, and so equivalently, what are all the things that we can know, what are all the questions that we can actually answer, all the way up to using some of those insights to write programs that produce graphics and play video games and are fun. So um, I'll demonstrate what I'm talking about when I'm mentioning uh, higher order functions in Python. All right, so I have um, a little programming environment that I've got here. I can write my programs on one side of the screen and run them on the other. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is um, how to treat functions as values. So normally we would write um, a function like this, so def give it some name, add one. Sorry, that blue is probably a little hard to see. Um, and then we give it some arguments. Maybe it takes one argument. And then um, all it does is add one to the argument. And it's going to have a return value. And as always, I'm writing super simple examples of functions. These are trivial things so you can understand the concepts behind how we're writing these functions uh, rather than all the detail that might go into a real example. A real example might be dozens of lines long or hundreds of lines long, but use the same principles to solve a problem that I'm going to show you here for something trivial like adding one to a number. All right, so this is how we've defined functions in the past. Um, you see this function has the name add one. And now I can just say add one, and let's give it argument three. And of course, let's print it so you can see the result. All right, I'm gonna get the add value four. But often, for example, when I use this three here. That's a value. It's an object in Python, but I didn't bother to give it a name. I didn't write something like x equals 3 and then 
x down here, it's just uh, redundant to do that. We, everyone knows what I mean when I just write 3, I'm going to create that object and use it right there. I don't need to keep track of its name. So we can apply that idea to functions as well. Um, the way we're going to do that, the way we're going to create functions as values, is with the lambda keyword. So remember, lambda calculus is where a lot of this comes from. That's why we use uh, the lambda keyword. So lambda is a, a Greek letter of the alphabet that Alonzo Church used throughout his lambda calculus. All right, so lambda x colon x plus 1. So the way this works is we have a lambda keyword here. This is not the name of the function. This is a keyword saying create a function value. The first um, variable after the lambda keyword is going to be the name of the argument that's being passed in. And then we have one expression here, x plus 1, no return value, you notice, and the value of this whole function when it's applied to something is going to be the argument plus 1. Notice I'm being careful not to talk about, to talk about the, um, the value of the function because this function hasn't been applied to anything yet. So the value of the function is simply its definition. It's what it could do if it was given an argument. All right. So if I were to say print lambda here, just like this. You see that what gets printed is actually a function. Right? This is actually a function object. You maybe could think um, as an analogy of this lambda as being like instantiation of a class. So this is the class, and we're going to instantiate that at some point. The way we instantiate it is actually by putting parentheses around it to create um, an object out of that function. And now we're going to give it a value. So we have another set of parentheses. I'm going to set it to 3 here. So that means that 3 gets bound to the x. And then the return value of the whole thing is going to be x plus 1. And sure enough, we get 4. So the same result as this code. So the first question you probably have is, why would we want to define functions this way instead of the old way? Well, as with a lot of things in programming, it just ena enables us to think differently about the problem So um, and be a little maybe more concise in what we're writing. So here we're generating a function that has a job, which is to add 1 to its argument. And then we're giving it an argument here, so it'll add 1 to that. But it's really no different than our previously defined function where we had def and we gave it a name. <laughs> but another reason why we wanted to define these what are called anonymous functions, these functions without names, is that we might want to pass them into another function. So higher order functions, and there are three we're going to look at here in Python, expect to take functions as arguments. And just like we don't necessarily want to give a name to the integer 3 when we give it to another function, we don't always want to give a name to a function if we're passing it in as an argument. All right, so let's take a look at one of those examples of higher order functions. The first one we're going to look at is something called map. Map is a function. It's built into Python. And it takes as its first argument some function. And then a list. So let's say 1 through 5 is our list. And it's going to apply whatever function is passed in as the first argument to each element of the second argument list. And then it's going to return the result of applying that function. Now in Python 3, um, when you do a map, you actually get a map object back as the return value. That's really important for um, efficiency reasons later on. We're not going to look at that in this course. So the first thing we're going to do is turn this into a list so we can actually print the values. All right. 
Um, I'm just going to call that result. So the result is going to be equal to the list generated by map, where map takes whatever this function is and applies it to the list and second argument. And now we can use our lambda. Now we could just say something like um, add one. That would work. In fact, let's go ahead and do that real quick. As you can see, we get the list back where we've added one to each element. But if we wanted to be <clears throat> perhaps a little more elegant, we can replace this with just a value of the function, not define a whole function with a name and then um, plug it in there. So we're going to say lambda x x plus 1. So we're creating the value that we're going to use right there in the argument. And we get the same answer. So this kind of structure, this one-liner, where we define a function right here, use the map on some list, um, is really very commonly used in, in Python. Um, it's really popular as a way of avoiding having to do a for loop, for example. So the other way of writing this would be something like, um, we have to do a for loop for i in range. or sorry, i in some list. And then we have to have another list that we're going to create. Um, let's start off empty. And then we'd say result.append. That would work. Um, times two, for example. And we could do that here as well. So we would just say times two. But this sort of um, structure, we have a map and a lambda. Everything is right there that you want to know about what you're doing to this list. The second higher order function that I want to show you uh, is something called filter. So filter is very much like map. It's going to take some function again, but this time the function has to be a Boolean function, it has to return true or false. And that function is going to be applied to every element of a list. So let's do the same thing here. list. And let's define a lambda with one argument again. And it's just going to check to see whether that argument is less than 4. So this is a comparator. It's always going to return a Boolean value. And what will happen is it'll create a new list that only contains the elements of the old list of the input list for which this lambda is true, for which this function is true. In other words, it's going to return all the values in the input list that are less than 4. And 
that's exactly what it does. So now we have a new list that's in the result. It's just uh, one, two, three. I can easily change this as lambda function. And we just get the values that are greater than four now. <clears throat> the last higher order function that I'm going to show you is um, a function called reduce. So map applied a function to every element of a list and returned the result of that. Uh, filter applied a boolean function to every element of the list and then just returned those values in a new list for which the function being applied was true. Reduce is going to basically apply a function to every element of a list but sort of gather up the results as it goes. So it makes a lot more sense if I show you what I mean. Now this is a um, this is a function that we have to import. Uh, it was not included by Guido in the in the default module, in the main module. Right. So reduce again takes a function <clears throat> as its first argument and a list of the second argument. Now the fact that it has a list of the second argument is not what makes these functions higher order functions. What makes them higher order functions is that they take another function as their argument. And you can imagine that if you had higher order functions, they could take other higher order functions as their arguments. You can get extremely complex very, very fast. And that's why Church was able to show that you could compute all functions by doing that. All right, so let's create another Lambda. Now, the argument, the functional argument that goes into reduce has to take two arguments. So let's say x and y. And in this case, we're just going to add x and y together. And then let's get our inputs. These lists, by the way, can be any sort of sequence. Um, technically, they can be iterators. Um, but for now, we'll just think about them as being, as being sequences. Um, so, for example, a list of numbers, it could be a string, it could be um, a tuple. All right. So what this reduce operation is going to do, it's going to take this function that we just defined here, that adds the first and second numbers together. It's going to take 1 and bind it to the first argument. So 1 becomes x, 2 becomes y, and it adds those together to get 3. Then and this is the trick in reduce, that result, 3, becomes the argument to x, and the next value in the list that we haven't looked at yet becomes y. So now we have 3 plus 3 is 6, so 6 goes back into x, and 4 goes in for y, and we get 10. Then 10 goes in for x, and 5 goes in for y. That's why I was saying it sort of gathers up the result as it goes. So in this case, it's just going to sum up all the numbers in this list. And again, we could have written this with recursion or the for loop. This is just another way of thinking about how to solve these problems, where we take a function that we're defining here and then passing these arguments. So it sort of does the recursion for you. Instead of having to write a base case and a recursive step, um, because it's so common to do that, these three functions, all th these three functions map filter and reduce, do that recursion for you. All right. Um, so whereas map and filter returned a list, reduce is going to return a single value because it's doing something to all the values and accumulating whatever operation it is uh, along the way. This could be multiplication, for example, in which case it would multiply all the values in the list.
So we're going to import um, from Funk Tools. And there's our 15, because that is the sum of these five numbers. And again, we can just easily change this to multiplication. So it'll just take 1 and 2, multiply those. 3 goes in for um, y. The product of 1 and 2, which is 2, goes in for x, and so on. We get 120. All right. And let's use palindrome as an example of filter. That's always our go to example. Um, let's make some palindromes here. Uh, let's see. Race car. Not race car is not a palindrome. Let's see. What else is there? Um, Rewire. Um, demigod. Is not a palindrome. Let's see. Um, kiosk. Santa and NASA is a pound drum. All right, so probably the um, simplest way to actually test this of all the ways we've looked at over the semester is just to say some word W is that equal to its reverse. All right, we can turn that into an anonymous function really easily with lambda. And then let's filter our list P by whether the um, elements are palindromes or not. So given a list, this should print out all the elements of the list that are palindromes. Let's give that a try. Okay, let's clear the screen a little. Make some space. And there we go. Yep. Rewire is close to a palindrome, but it's not a palindrome. Race card palindrome. A Santa NASA is a palindrome. All right. Um, so I'm going to end there. Uh, that's um, the end of our functional programming um, exercises. Py Python is not a functional programming language. Uh, there are lots of functional languages out there, like Haskell and Scheme, that um, rely very, very heavily on these kinds of concepts of recursion, no side effects, and higher order functions. But Python is really popular because it supports all kinds of different programming paradigms, object-oriented programming, procedural programming, and has quite a bit of support for functional programming as well. All right, um, I hope to see you soon, and that ends this video. Goodbye.